Welcome everybody to another podcast of the Everything Horror. My name is Paul Dolsky, and man, has it been a little bit since the last episode, so as I find myself like staggering for words, it's probably because of that. Anyway, we have a an amazing guest today, which I think everybody of the franchise should know this man by the novels, and he was a co-writer for the PS Vita game, Resistance Burning Skies, but enough of me, so we're just going to go right into William Dietz, and in this for this uh, podcast, if um, you hear me say Bill, uh, he has allowed me to call him Bill instead of William, so I don't want anybody to get confused here. So anyway, Bill, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, man. You know, I think it's an honor, to, especially, uh, you know, you, you serve for the country and everything else. So, again, uh, you know, my uh, my uh, <laughs> thanks for you as well. Yes, sir. Good to be here. Good. Um, so, Bill, um, you know, talk to us a little bit. So, I know you were sort of like grown up in the, um, uh, forgive me, the Marines or something. I know it was like right there in front of me a second ago, but you you served anyway, basically. And then did that kind of help inspire the way you write? Yeah, let's talk about that. So um, I did. I, uh, I was not a very good uh, student. Um, <laughs> came barely scraped my way out of high school and um, tried to get a job and and uh, and the economy was such at the time that they just weren't hiring uh, high school graduates who didn't know anything I don't know why they they didn't want that but uh, but they didn't so um, you know I looked around for things to do and it finally occurred to me that probably my best choice was to join the military I came from a and, and come from a Navy family, and my dad was a sailor, and and um, you know so that that inspired me, and uh, so I decided to join the Navy, as I said. And at the time, uh, the Navy had a program where you could you could choose what kind of training you wanted, um, and you might get your choice depending upon. Uh, whether or not you pass certain tests after you got in the Navy. So it's kind of like a deal like, sure, you can do that so long as you pass all our tests once you're in the Navy. And then if you don't succeed in passing those tests, you'll just be swinging a mop on some destroyer, you know. So, uh, but anyway, I had no options and I needed to eat stuff. I didn't want to live off my mom. So uh, so I joined and um, I wanted to be a medic. And I passed the tests that uh, they threw at me and uh, was selected for hospital course school. And the Navy is um, kind of different from, say, the Army, for example, in that Navy medics, um, you know, serve on Navy ships and on Navy bases, but they also serve in Marine Corps units um, after they've been in a while and after they've gone through a combat school to learn how to be uh, a Marine, basically. And um, so long story short, um, I went in the Navy, became a medic, uh, spent some time in a Navy hospital in Beaufort, South Carolina. Vietnam was cranking up big time. A lot of people were dying, lots of uh, need for medics. Uh, they selected me to go to uh, the combat school, Camp Pendleton, California, learn how to be a Marine. I'm not sure I succeeded just in the short period of time they granted us, but uh, I learned some, I, I learned some things definitely uh, there. And um, just about everybody who graduated from that school was going straight off to Vietnam to replace medics who um, had been killed or wounded or timed out. And that's fully what I thought was going to happen. And this group of guys I was with, there's 20 of us, and 18 sets of, of orders came in uh, to go straight to Vietnam, and two sets of orders came in to go to Hawaii, and guess who went to Hawaii? I mean, it was an unbelievable stroke of, <laughs> of good fortune. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a situation, though, where um, 
you know, you're going to Hawaii. That's the good news. The bad news is you're joining an outfit there that was in training to go to Vietnam later on. Uh, anyway, so I, uh, I did, as you mentioned, spend time in the military with both the Navy and the Marine Corps. And it did teach me a lot about uh, military things, military values, military, you know, operations and so on that um, I was able to incorporate into my books and hopefully make them feel a little more real. Yeah, I think a lot of days, um, if I may say, it, it's really hard when some people are trying to make it sound realistic, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound like the detail that they really need are there. So, like, with you having to be in the, the service, really, like, between the Navy and the Marine and all the tests that you had to do, like you were just mentioning, like, right there, that's a good background to have all the, you know, the key ideas of what you would need into the book to really expand on the atmosphere of whatever the story that you're trying to tell. And um, in this case, you know, um, I just want to also say real quick that Resistance Fall of Man came out first for PS3, which was done by Insomniac Game. Um, I just want to quickly remind people that Resistance Fall of Man, uh, on the back of PS3, it says, There was no defense, there was no cure. Each of our casualties just increases their numbers. Russia went dark over a year ago. Europe fell weeks later. The Chimera will reach the other continent within days. It is July 11th, 1951. Amidst the ruins of England, U.S., and British forces take the final stand. And um, so I don't get lost too here. Um, just so that way it helps, I, I guess, clarify some things. So Resistance Fall of Man came out around the debut of PS. Three, which was November of 2006, I believe. And then it came out later on to other continents um, in 2007. So anyway, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because Bill here, or William, depending on how you would like to recognize him, because of Bill William Stein. being the author. Well, I'm just talking to, like, the, uh, sure. the listener for a minute. But yeah, like, you know him under his pen name, I guess I'll just say as William, and he wrote the very first book for Resistance to Gathering Storm. So I guess, Bill, in this case, you know, we're, so we're talking almost like two and a half years later since the first game, um, and then you ended up telling the tale of Resistance to Gathering Storm, which is basically Nathan Hale's journey into the um, original mission of the Chimera. So I guess, and I know uh, it's been a while, so I guess kind of talk to us about the process and everything else that went on. Okay, good. Well, first of all, let's talk about the big picture and, and at that time what was going on in the industry. Um, as games came out back then, um, there was a interest on the part of um, intellectual property owners, IP owners, uh, like Insomniac Games and so on, uh, to build out their their franchise, their, their income, their penetration of the market uh, by uh, creating books that were based on the games. So let's just for a second take a moment and, um, and let me explain that there's kind of two kinds of tie-in books at that time. There were um, uh, books that were actually uh, renditions of the game called novelizations where you're just t creating a novel from a game and a good example of that would be Halo the Flood which I wrote uh, and wrote actually uh, prior to Resistance the Gathering Storm. Um, that's a case where you sit down as a writer and you play the game over and over and over again you take a lot of notes and you gather all the materials you possibly can to work with and um, then you try to replicate the game only in print form. So that's a novelization. Then, you know, there's um, 
there's tie-in novels which are different. They're based on the universe, but they're not the game. They're different from the game. They usually have, you know, um, a sideways story from the game is one way to put it. So, you know, you've got whatever happened in the most recent game, but in a, in a, a tie-in novel, uh, you've got characters and so on who are in the game, who are put in the book and put into situations that are not seen in the game. And the idea is to give players slash readers a richer experience. You can play the game, you can read the book, and by reading the book, you find out more about the universe and the backstory on people and and people who aren't even in the game and so on. So that was the idea at the time, and it was a uh, as it was a pretty profitable um, kind of strategy. Uh, and so, um, generally, writers who wrote tie-in novels. Um, and I say that in the past tense because there's not a lot of that going on anymore. Um, you know, generally, though, they were people who had a proven capacity to do that kind of work. For example, I, I don't know for sure what went on in the discussions that led up to me being um, offered the job to write uh, books in the resistance world. But I assume it had something to do with, um, you know, my success at writing uh, Halo the Flood for, you know, uh, for the whole Halo franchise, you know. So you do one or two and and they sell and then people go, OK, well, this guy or this woman, you know, is good at doing that. And um, then maybe somebody reaches out to you, which is the case uh, with uh, The Gathering Storm. And typically, I would also say to anybody who's interested in writing um, and writing this kind of book, generally, you can't um, chase them. You can't find them. You, you know, you can't, you know, write write a book and then, you know, become a tie-in writer. Generally, they approach you through your agent or whatever. So um, <clears throat> that made it a very small community of people who did that kind of work. Uh, these days, apparently profitability of writing and having that kind of uh, book has dropped off because I just don't see any in the market anymore. And um, for that matter, I don't see a lot of, um, you know, new first person shooters that kind of, you know, generate that kind of story either. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to even think of an example, but I, Honestly, cannot. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, you know what? I don't think I've ever seen one yet. I mean, why haven't we got like a novel for like I don't know, uh, Killing Four? <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think there's lots of games that that where that hasn't been done, and it must be you know financial. The reason it's got to be that they don't sell. Yeah, or with a game like Killing Four, I don't really know if there's really a per se a story because I mean, if anything, it the same. Well, I don't want to keep. I don't want to say that. I mean, they they did add some new um, enemies in Killing Four too, but uh, what do I want to say? It doesn't seem like there is some sort of storyline. It's just you just go and shoot and get to the boss, and then it's over with. Repeat you know yeah well that sounds like you know i mean um i'm sure you're right about that but sometimes it's the task of the writer a tie-in writer to create a story and and that's usually the case i mean when they come to you as they came to me they say we want a book we want it to be you know after this game but before this other game it's going to bridge these two games and um so go ahead, Bill, create the book, you know, create a, a proposal outline, submit it to us, and, um, you know, we'll take a look at it. And if we like it, you know, we'll approve it. And if not, we'll, um, you know, help you work on it and then get it to where we want. Um, if you'd like, I'll talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, yeah, I'd okay. love to hear it. All right. 
So, you know, as I just indicated, the way that it generally worked is they'd say, we want a tie-in novel that give you something like a time frame, and you would, um, you know, put together your notion of what the book could look like and so on. That would be submitted to a producer um, who, uh, and the editor of the publishing company that's going to publish the game, so or you publish the book. So right away, you've got a couple of people there at least, and probably more that um, are going to look at your proposal and and decide whether or not it's um, going to make the cut. But also in the background, you've got this whole team of creative people at the gaming company. These are it's an amazing scene. I've had the good fortune of visiting these studios and, and uh, you know, being there for a day or two with the team and, and so on. And, you know, these are dark rooms filled with toys, filled with people that, shall we say, dress in interesting ways, a lot of wild hair, you know, um, people sitting in the dark. The, you kind of hear the murmur of, you know, uh, games being played and and everything going on um those people um have an opinion they they own the games you know in the emotional sense they don't own it you know in the physical so that they don't actually own the games but they own them emotionally and intellectually so they take everything that the tie-in writer wants to do very personally and they have a strong opinions about whether or not, you know, it's uh, the storyline that, that somebody like myself has developed, whether that they like it or whether it's believable or whatever. And then, of course, you as a writer, you're going, believable? What the hell are we talking about, believable? You know, this is a completely fictitious game and a fictitious book. But no. They're living this day to day. So to them, this is very real and, you know, and you don't want to violate certain things and they have strong held opinions about characters. And so you write, you write that, you know, Nathan Hale, you know, uh, one of the characters, the main character in, uh, you know, in the resistance books, Nathan Hale is going to do X, Y, Z and they go, no, he'd never do that. Never in that big argument will start. And, you know, pretty soon the producer and different people have to get involved and they have to say, well, you know, uh, we are doing a book here. And yeah, Nathan Hale would do that and um, blah, blah. And so Bill can do that. And so there's a lot of politics to it, a lot of teamwork to it. You need to be very patient. You need to listen, you know, and uh, you need to cultivate those people. But you also need to stand up for yourself and stick to your guns. Um, you know, pun intended, and, and uh, in order to get the story written, so it's a, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a team thing. And I mentioned earlier that I would be usually given the opportunity to visit with the team, maybe at the front end, to begin to establish a rapport. And at the time when I started really doing a lot of that work, I was well into my sixties, so I'd come strolling into this room. Everybody's like 18 and a half years old, you know, and they uh, go, what is this? Who invited daddy to this, you know? Oh, boy. Your grandpa, you know, where's what's this guy about? And then they'd be told he's going to write at this book and they would, their eyes would get big and they'd go, you know, I mean, they're just thinking, what? How could this be, you know? So you had, a, at least I, I found that there was typically a credibility gap that had to be closed, that, no, I can play the game as well as a lot of you can. And not only that, but, you know, I can do something more. I can, you know, put together this, this book that people will want to read. But it takes some proving to do that. Indeed. So when writing uh, Resistance to Gathering Storm, is that like what you uh, ended up, doing kind of like what you were previously saying where you went and uh played the game so you had to play resistant fall man obviously to take notes of like what guns were what nathan hale was sort of doing throughout the game and all the other characters especially we'll get to another character for um i want to say your other book but he would also became um the protagonist for like uh 
resistance tree. But anyway, so I guess the point to this is, so Bill, is this sort of what you did where you went, played the game, took notes, so that way you could know, like, hey, we had this this uh, type of gun, like the bullseye, the carbon, uh, XYZ basically was the missions, and, you know, especially trying to remember the Weepers, Chimera, and all these other type of right. weird... Right. Uh, yeah, so is that sort of like what you had to do for the Gathering Storm? Yeah, let me let me hold this up. Um, I see if people can see it. Is that right side up for you and readable? Yep. It's backwards for me as I look up there at the at the uh, screen. Do you see that? I do. Okay. So um, yeah, basically uh, it was a combination of things where you would receive lots of materials boxes would come in the mail and they'd be uh you know full of notes pictures you know all kinds of things um cds with material on them and you would of course have to absorb all of that but yeah you had to play the game through and play it through a lot of times and be reasonably good at it uh in order to get a feel for it and then to understand it and so you're correct both of those things were very important uh, to getting it to getting it together, and you know some of this, like you were talking about weapons, um, that's the kind of thing where often they would give you a list. Here's a list of the weapons, and you know kind of what they would do, and so on. Um, and so that kind of thing was uh, was often available to you. Uh, sideways from our discussion, you know, I wrote tie-in novels for um, for Dark Forces Star Wars games. And, um, you know, let me tell you, talk about boxes of material coming. It was because they had this whole universe of different books sideways from yours, which they wanted you to understand and be, you know, all these characters, literally hundreds of them in the Star Wars franchise. And you were or were not allowed to use them in um, in whatever book you're writing, depending on the timeline and where those story, where those characters were supposed to be at that point in the Dark Forces games. And man, it was complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Star Wars is uh, sort of a headache nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, it gives. I mean, it, it makes uh, it makes me unhappy because of the fact that they aren't making you know uh, some some great movies, which they could be. I mean, CGI is getting better and better and better, and you know, there's an opportunity here to just be at least releasing one really good Star Wars movie every year, and these slackers aren't doing anything with it. I, it's just amazing and sad. Well, um, hmm. well, I guess we can always blame the mouse, I guess, right? I, I think so. I don't know who else we would blame. I mean, they have it sitting there. It's just right there in their hands, and they're not doing it. I mean, I know it would. I mean, you know, if Dune 2 can be successful, there's no reason Star Wars 87 can't be successful, so. You got a point. You got a point. Yeah, Star Wars has uh, not really been doing too well the last few movies, last that I knew. I haven't uh, seen them because I kind of got dropped off the whole Star Wars thing. But Man Mandalorian, Mandalorian. Uh -huh. um, I heard that wasn't bad, but I think that might have been the one where again where I heard like the way they ended it, it was okay ish. So I don't That's know. Okay, huh? Yeah, I haven't seen that, so can't. Yeah, can't I can't comment. comment. Yeah. Yeah, I can't either. But um, is there a favorite part in the Gathering Storm build that you remember writing about uh, Nathan Hale's like, journey at all? You know, it's been a, a long time. So we're talking about, I think, 2008 or nine for Gathering Storm and something like uh, 2011 on... Um, resistance a hole in the sky so uh that's a long time you know i i don't i can't just say you know page 
156, there's this great scene with Nathan Hale doing whatever. But, you know, I, I can say that the type of scene and the type of thing that I enjoyed so much about the books were, you know, the um, scenes that had to do with um, the moral problems that people found themselves in, you know, the, the, I mean, not just the struggle and the fighting and everything, but, you know, the, the sacrifices that had to be made by people, the, you know, the, the, the losses, the friendships, the relationships between characters. I mean, I thought those were very strong elements. I thought the books and of course, <clears throat> this is, I'm biased, obviously, but I thought the books, you know, were pretty strong in uh, all of those areas that they weren't just shoot, you know, shoot them up after shoot them up, but there was certainly plenty of that. Um, so. Yeah. Well, to, to touch on that, uh, Bill, you know, um, I will say a lot of people will probably agree with me when they say that because of your book. Uh, it helped answer a lot of questions that the game gave us and you ended up answering them for us because of your book. So I think we can all that's, appreciate. That's a good observation. I mean, that when I would start a project, one of the books, that's exactly the kind of thing I would look for. That was, I saw that as an opportunity. You know, I would say, well, this particular character is, uh, you know, is here on the scene and, and uh, where did they come from? What did they do? Why are they here? What did they do before this? And, um, you know, maybe what are they going to do after this? And, um, you know, so that, that was always, uh, uh, like I say, a chance to do something fun. And uh, then the problem came sometimes of selling it to the team, you know, but uh, more often than not, I was able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once again, you you kind of gave us like another point that I'll probably try if I remember come back to. But um, so I'm trying to remember like the timeline here because obviously you just mentioned the second book that came out, which was 2011, uh, Resistance to Hole in the Sky, which was actually the release date was August 2nd of 2011. Once again, published by Del Rey Books, I want to say. Correct. Del same, Rey. same publisher that did Gathering Storm, right? Yep. Um, so, it's, so the way I was trying to figure out how to talk to you, Bill, mm -hmm. and it, the way the timeline is going a little bit. So the Gathering Storm is technically the novelization right for Fall of Man, which helped, like I was saying, like answer some of the questions that the game did not get a chance to tell us. So the next thing that would come into play would be um, the PS Vita game, uh, Burning Skies, that was released in May of 2012. Now I know I'm I, I'm skipping the second book for a minute, but if we're going by timeline of the the game per se, right? Then this was yeah. Then this was supposed to be the introduction to the Chimera coming into the United States for the first time, like not before Resistance Three anyway, where they actually did a full invasion but this is would like um um i don't know if baby step would be the right uh you know the right wording but basically it was their way of beginning the invasion yeah now um so i guess for people that may remember um resistant burning skies wasn't a soldier for those that did play it and it was like a firefighter. And what I loved about that was the fact that you actually got to swing a fireman's axe for the Camaro. Right. I was I, w I was having so much fun with that. Uh, yeah. So, that Bill, cool uh, yeah. so you know, you were you were telling me through our chat that you were also the co-writer. Somehow, I missed that on your website when I was like digging for you, but. I mean, so 
Hmm. Once again, we're talking like almost 12 years ago, Bill. So my apologies here. So what part of the co-writing, especially for the game, were you part of? Because, I mean... Uh, well, there was, there was just two, yeah. two writers for the game, me and a guy named Mike Bates. And Mike, you know, had a background in, in uh, gaming and writing games. And he was co-located with the team of, the, of you know, developers and, you know, uh, uh, technical people creating the games. And um, so it, it wasn't, it, it was just a deal where based on um, my performance writing the two previous books, um, Sony said, hey, this guy does, you know, has done well. and um, you know, he comes up with stuff and he can fit in and so on. And then the rest of the teams know him. So, you know, they, uh, they chose me as uh, one or two people to write the game, co-writing anything, co-writing a game, co-writing a book. You know, these are always um, challenging things because you got two people coming together and it can either be very, uh, it can be a synergy or it can be a fight. And um, I would say with Mike, it was um, more synergy than fight. But there were times where we disagreed and, you know, and we had to work out which way it was going to go. Uh, and then we, we had, you know, kind of like a common deal. And that was as the writers, it was our job to create the structure for the game that they were actually going to put everything together and make it happen. And you had to sell your ideas to the to the game producer, to the executive who's really in charge of the whole game and the top people in the team. You had to get their buy-in, obviously, to proceed. So there was a constant, and this isn't like a criticism. This is just a natural part of the process. There's a constant tension there. And, um, you know, I was not co-located with the team. I was working from home. Mike was co-located with the team, so he had the advantage of being there face-to-face. And we had to work, you know, all of this together and, um, and work it out and get to a plot. And we, we would pitch things constantly. You know, Mike and I would come together, decide what we like, get a single voice, then pitch it and, um, you know, and be turned down, you know, and pitch it and be turned down and, and pitch it and finally succeed. And, you know, and so the good news is about that kind of process is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of ideas churn and come to the surface and eventually, hopefully gel. But it also means that a lot of ideas are compromised, uh, you know, the you know, the clarity that might go with a hat with a single author, a single writer, a single producer, whatever. Some of that is lost because of just the compromises that everybody's making to get along, you know. So that 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 process was it's kind of a jungle out there. And uh that's what Mike and I had to deal with. Hmm. So is it safe to say there, Bill, that the fireman idea was maybe not your idea because I know you're usually the soldier guy. So was it Mike that thought of being the firefighter? Actually, that's a really good question. Um, the, uh, as I recall, the firefighter was already an established uh, thing in the minds of the producers <coughs> when Mike and I were, you know, uh, hired on as writers. We were given that, you know, we were told right from the beginning our concept is that this is a civilian, he's not a soldier, but he's a, a heroic uh, individual. You know, he's we're gonna, he's going to have an axe. Um, we're, we want that axe to be prominent in the, you know, in, in the play, the gameplay. And uh, we want to see a bunch of chimera, you know, axe to death and, uh, <laughs> and so on. And so that was given to us. Uh, along with sort of a basic, you know, setting and, and so on. But it was, uh, and some basic characters, but it was up to us to make the rest, you know, happen. And, and we did. And uh, uh, so there you go. 
I guess, uh, you know, uh, I, I, since we don't have uh, the other writer with us, I'm just trying to think here how to make this uh, question work. But so would there stuff that you and Mike were trying to possibly like add to the game that could not work because again it kind of goes back to like you were just saying he just like a normal civil uh civ uh Jesus uh, <laughs> civilian there we go and um it's rather than like a soldier who already had like the quote the basic training type attitude to uh defend you know defend the country type of thing where now as it's a firefighter where, man, it's been a, a few years since I played Burning Skies. So you're basically just trying to be like that, uh, the, the hero of the, uh, I'm just going to say the city because I can't, I can't remember too much of it anymore. Right. Well, you know, yes, in answer to your uh, initial question, for example, I do remember this. You know, there was a female character, and uh, her name escapes me at the moment, you know, but she was a very strong female character, very competent. Both Mike and I liked that. We, we liked the way she played. There was, um, in Mike and I's minds, I believe, you know, there was a, an instant attraction between her and the firefighter. And we felt, you know, we wanted to advance that relationship we wanted to, to develop it, and we wanted to, uh, you know, have them um, be, you know, uh, in love with each other, frankly. And we thought that it was possible to do that in a, in a game, and that it didn't always have to be that, you know, the female character gets killed or the female character, you know, uh, uh, disappears so that they can bring in another female character later on and, you know, in some future game or whatever. And, and we saw opportunities there and even a, what we thought was a need for this relationship to advance the game in a way that makes sense. And part of that was driven by think about what firefighters do. And this is what Mike and I would talk to each other about. You know, firefighters rescue people. They save people. And so, you know, um, we wanted to, uh, to, you know, advance that, but you can only save her so many times, you know, before that becomes just ridiculous, you know. So um, it had to be get bigger than that and, and um, not just get stalled on, on um, him always, you know, coming to, to rescue her. Plus, we didn't want to have a female character that needed to be rescued all the time. We felt that was very retro and that, you know, that um, a lot of our female players and everything would prefer to have a woman to identify with that was capable of doing a lot of things on her own and wasn't dependent on this firefighter to always do things for her. So, you know, um, I think we... We lost more of those battles than we won, frankly. Uh, but, you know, the, the game still works, I think. Yeah, and to answer your question here, uh, so the main protagonist's name, I believe, was Tom Riley. And I yeah, believe the, fem right. and yeah. the female character that I believe you're uh, having problems remembering is, I believe it, Ellie... Martini, or um, I might be pronouncing the last name wrong. Uh, yeah, Martini or something. Yeah, that that sounds right. And so, um, so we, you know, like I say, we, we uh, there's a lot of things that were not uh, difficult where the where everybody agreed on them, but there were there were things like that, and um, we had. A producer and a producer, an assistant producer and a producer over her, as I recall. And um, they didn't always agree. So that's just typical of these situations. It always shoots who he is. So, Bill, did you, uh, you know, when you finally were able to, were you able to play like resisting Burning Skies? Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a uh, player and everything and I played it. 
I thought it was um, I thought it was cool. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, but I I did feel that the little tiny player thing, you know, was not as good as a PC, frankly. You know, uh, and uh, you know, I like the bigger screen and so on. And it it unfortunately I don't think it caught on. You know, and I don't think that everybody's toting one of those around these days. And right, yeah. Well, PlayStation did sort of stop supporting the Vita for a while now. I know yeah. that. Um, right. I think now the new thing is uh, the Backbone that just came out. But anyway, uh, so I mean, there could be a chance for a return to see Burning Skies again, maybe for like back uh, Backbone or something. Yeah, well, what you know, what I what I would love to see would be the um, original games, you know, made for PC. Um, you know, reproduced so you could get them on Steam. You know, that would be my dream. You could play them on your PC uh, and perhaps on other platforms as well. But um, that would that would just be awesome. I would really love that. Speaking of which, uh, we just had Ben Studio just port the PSP title Resistance Retribution to console recently to PS4 and PS5. So we literally had like a handheld game for PSP back in the day, Resistance Retribution, now come to like, you know, the new generation of uh, gaming. The only thing is um, it's not on Steam yet, but I do know PlayStation has been slowly putting some of their games on Steam. So who knows? Maybe we could see Resistance pop up on PC one day. That would be that would be cool. Uh, or even even cooler would be to have some you know uh, company come along and just make a brand new resistance game, you know, with all of today's technology and all the all the that that would bring to it. I mean, it's a great concept. It's a great concept, and uh, you know, the aliens were well conceived, and you know, the graphics and the you know the the scenery and everything was great. It was just well done. It was just fun. It was fun. I enjoyed playing it. I enjoy, you know, I had to play it and I was enjoying having to play it. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? I'm getting paid for this? <laughs> this to is play all... and to write? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this it was great. It doesn't get any better than that. I guess. So, it was, so was there a little bit of a different, well, there, I mean, I know there is a difference because obviously in this case, you actually were, uh, you know, writing for a game. But so I guess in this case, Bill, was there anything differently that you, uh, that you had to do besides like, cause like we were kind of mentioning before you would play, take down notes and then kind of be like, Hey, you know, like this guy went off screen just to do something. So you know, I'm going to make note of this so that way I can actually put it into the book, per se, which is what I was saying about you answering questions within the Gathering Storm. So I guess in this case, was there any type of difficulties of trying to, you know, trying to even make it work for, I don't know, if there was going like like when you were co-writing with Mike, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is, were you trying to make it so that if there was a sequel or, uh, you know, Burning Skies t uh, or Resistance, whatever, not even a sequel, but these characters were to come back, like, I guess, what was the mindset there for you and Mike? Yeah, I think I think the mindset that Mike and I had <clears throat> was the same mind mindset that the team had. And that is, is that you hope that, it, that it's going to come back. You hope that it's successful and uh, there's going to be, you know, burning skies, one, two, three, four, five, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the hope. And um, so nobody would, would want to kill the, the, you know, the main character off and uh, uh, any more than they would have killed Nathan Hale off. Um, 
but you know, secondary characters that could happen definitely. And, uh, so, um, so yeah, I think people generally approached it hoping that, that, that it would have a, you know, a, a lot, an ongoing life. Right. Right. And speaking of, uh, killing off characters and stuff. So I think that pretty much sums up uh, Burning Skies as best as we can and I can. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, speaking of, like I was saying, killing off people. So Nathan Hale, spoiler alert for people who may not have beaten this game. And if you haven't, well, um, I guess too bad now because it's been almost 20, 20 years almost uh, by... Uh, brain is not good with math right now 14 years to be exact or so but anyway uh you know in resistant 2 we saw the demise of nathan hale who ended up having to basically get uh, uh eliminated i'll just say because he had the chimera virus it was taken over him i think it was even past saving for him so the character Joseph Capelli came into play here. Right. Right. And uh, before that, though, I believe the second book that you did, Resistance to Hole in the Sky, um, you kind of had Joseph Capelli be the main protagonist in that book, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. And, um, you know, Capelli, as I recall, you know, in the, before Nathan Hale, you know, died, uh, you know, was almost sort of, you know, a negative character, you know, in some ways. Uh, but um, uh, I chose to and got approval to, uh, to write a book around him and, and his background and, and all of that. I felt like it worked. As I recall, he had a cool pet dog, um, <laughs> you know, which I enjoyed writing. Uh, but yeah, no, you're you're right about Nathan Hale and so on. And that was actually I I thought that was a good thing. That was a great example of, you know, that, that wasn't a decision I made. That was a decision that you know that the team made, and uh, and so on. And I thought it was I thought it made sense. Right. So, I mean, so Resistance to Hole in the Sky is basically the prequel, or, yeah, 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 prequel. Yeah, to, it's, a, it's not, you know, it's, this is, remember, we talked about this whole deal of yeah. whether something is a novelization or whether it's sideways from the main game. I'd yep. say it was more like sideways, you know, it was more like, running parallel to the main universe and game stream of things, consistent with it, building on it, maybe, you know, exploring it more thoroughly, but not driving, you know, a main plot like the Nathan Hale stuff was. Right, right. Well, he, uh, Jeff, Joseph did get a, a honorable just, no, sorry, that was Nathan Hale. That was, uh, oh, no, it was Joseph Capelli. Okay, I was right. Yeah, so he was dishonorably, uh, dishonorably discharged, is what I'm trying to say here. Um, right. So, because I'm a, I'm assuming it was because he's the one that took out Nathan Hale. But um, anyway, so he ended up becoming what they called like a hired runner. So, I guess, I mean, from there, um, Bill, so did you, like, for this book, for the prequel, did you reach out to them, or did uh, did they reach back out to you to kind of... Uh, no, I, you know, uh, as I was sort of indicating before, you know, you have, you don't have the really the power, even as a as a writer who's written in a universe before. You you're not allowed to just come in and say, "Hey, I want to write X Y Z book," and you know, and like that. You, it, it's a down, you know, it's a top down process where the, where they say, 
we're interested in another book and so on. Have you got any ideas? I don't remember all the particulars of it, but I think that I played some role in the decision to create the notion of what a runner was and, you know, and, and Capelli. I, I, it may have been that, that, um, um, that they suggested Capelli. I honestly don't remember at this point. It's been so long, but, um, I do, I do remember that the book was, again, it's an, a good word for it would be, it's an elaboration on the greater game, you know, and the other books. It's building everything out. It's giving it more depth. It's, it's giving it more, you know, kind of, um, searching for the right adjective, but sort of more, you know, it's more granular, more, more, more fully realized would be another way to put it. Um, so you can really bury yourself in the whole concept, the whole, you know, property. And, um, and a, maybe the finest example of that ever being done, in my opinion, would be Lucasfilms and Star Wars. I mean, books about every character, um, you know, cross characters, you know, there's be something going on over here and a character from that will appear over here in this other book. And, you know, people are, you know, and, and all of this um, detail and all of this continuity and so on, it made it very hard to keep track of the Star Wars universe. They had somebody um, doing just only that. Um, and then uh, later had to build that team out larger but that was that was really an example of fully realizing a universe, creating it, and just fully exploiting it. Um, right back before the mouse got it. <laughs> um, well, I guess Bill, like like you just mentioned, it's hard to remember this one. It sounds like so. I guess hmm. I'm trying to figure out if you're going to even be able to answer this one. And that is, so when it came down to a hole in the sky, which uh, took place before Resistance 3, obviously here. Uh, so not only did we get Nathaniel Hale death and then in Resistance 3, so you had to basically write this book like right after the death and right before Resistance 3 starts, or however that works. So I guess, and you were just mentioning before with Star Wars, how you had a, a like a book upon mountains of books. So right. were there any type of resources that you had going into this book besides possibly giving like Joseph Capelli like a like a background of who he was? Like, was there any sort of indication of like what you could and couldn't use, or did they tell you like, hey, this is how we're starting the game of Resistance Three, where you can maybe sort of have a hole in the sky kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, smooth do like a smooth move into the beginning of Resistance Three, I guess. <laughs> Well, it was a it was a team effort always, and I think that you know I had guidance from above without a doubt. Um, <clears throat> but I think by that time, the relationship with the larger team had evolved, and I had a good a good relationship with um, the guy who ran Insomniac. Uh, by then, he uh, he he was a uh, uh, a very good writer himself had a degree, if I remember, like maybe even a master's degree in English or something. And um, and by that time, um, you know, I think he had he had said, well, I know he'd he'd sent me emails, you know, complimenting uh, what I did. So I know he approved, and and um, I think that that it had his support. And when I created the uh, outline for that i'm sure as i recall was approved by him and once he approved it then it was uh, golden you know then it it, <laughs> then it was going to happen so um that's how i think it uh, how i think it proceeded yeah all right well bill i mean we're coming up on uh, your time frame that we had given but um Real quick, I guess, like if if 
there was ever a chance to write another book in the Resistance universe, would you jump on board again? Oh, I, I, you know, I would sure, you know, you can't for sure say yes, because it would depend on a lot of different factors, but probably I'd be very interested. I'd at least want to have that conversation and, and find out, you know, all about it and so on like that. I did enjoy the books. I, I thought that they were and the games too. the games were, I thought for their time, they were just top notch. And, um, you know, there's a lot of writers, um, uh, who think that tie-in books are, you know, kind of low-class work, you know, that if you do tie-in novels, you're kind of a hack, you know, that's, that's the view that some people have. Um, I don't share that view. I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to practice your, you know, the craft of writing. It, you don't have the freedom that you have when you write your own books. You're, you know, but, um, at the same time, I mean, it's fun when you're invited into the Star Wars, you know, for example, universe or the, the, um, um, you know, you're, you're invited into the Halo universe uh, and you get to play with all the toys, all the characters, shape things, you know, do things. Uh, if you're into those games like I was, then, you know, it's it's fun and and you get to leave your mark on those franchises and um you know i would think that today you know if you uh like google william c deets you're going to come up with a lot of uh, deets novels but you're going to come up with you know halo and resistance and you know star wars and all that stuff uh and i'm proud of the work i did on in those franchises Hey, I mean, you know, it was it was a pleasure. It was actually, you know, what's funny, Bill, is I never knew that there was books and a comic until like, um, I want to say last year when I found a resistance group on Facebook, and um, because of that group, that's where I learned that there were books and a comic. And there was even a soundtrack CD for Resistance 3 that I had no idea about. So, <laughs> so um, it was nice to really go back to see like how much people still want a new Resistance game. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, Bill, is there... So, you mentioned how you were playing the games and stuff. Was there... What, what Resistance game would you say was your, your favorite one to play? Uh, that's tough. Um, I think probably, you know, the one that sticks out to me is Gathering Storm because, you know, it was probably the first one that I played and I was just, you know, struck by the, you know, boom, wow, this is so, you know, at the time it was so new. It was so, and it was a little bit controversial because they had, you know, shot some, footage, graphic footage, and so on in a church in England um, to use as a scene for all kinds of mayhem, and people were really upset about them using that church footage to do that, and that's when it first broke through for me. It was before I'd been hired or got involved, but I just, you know, so when I, when I played the game where that footage was there, and I was seeing the footage and everything, I was you know, blown away at, at all the things they'd done. They were doing some really cutting edge things at that time. You know, the feel of it was different and it was like new and shiny. And uh, uh, so I think that's the one in answer to your question. Okay. So uh, just to, just to correct you, Bill, because you named your, your okay. book title, um, you meant resistance fall of man. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nope, Not nope, my book, go. the game. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you for setting that straight. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I just didn't want somebody to get confused and big, huh? Huh? What? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, what I guess, that? so two more questions I got for you, Bill, and I will wrap this up for you. So the, the last question is, for those that are listening that may be resistant players, what do you have any any uh, final words that you would like to give to the resistant people out there that love the universe just as much as you? 
Well, you know, I think just keep it up. I think it's, it's you know, by now, any any player of the kind that you just described has played all the games 80 times and, you know, got them fully memorized and so on. So uh, I think all that, you know, that we can do is to kind of, you know, hope that somebody will come along and uh, understand the value of that franchise and bring it back to life. And so just keep the faith, people. I um yeah keep the keep the battle of the resistance right. going <laughs> right. You bet. Keep All right. right. Yeah. Now, Bill, the last question I will uh, send you off with is: If anybody wanted to keep up with with you for like your books, or like, is there any upcoming work that you're even doing too? But where can people find and keep up to date with with your stuff? The best place to see everything I've done and whatever it is I'm doing and whatever's new is my website, and it's williamcdeets.com. And um, you know, the, the, I've got the I've got kind of like two types of things coming out right now. I, I have a uh, ongoing series of books called Winds of War, which are alternate history World War Three books. You know, World War Three is underway. Each book has its own characters, its own setting, uh, but takes place within the larger framework. And then, you know, um, I have uh, also continued to write science fiction books. So like my, uh, maybe my best known novel of all time is Legion of the Damned. And um, <clears throat> I released another Legion of the Damned book recently. And that's, a very, you know, you can see that on the website, along with a full bibliography of all my books, um, you know, a little bit of stuff about me. And uh, that's the place to go, williamcdeets.com. All right, Bill. Well, right, thank man. you so much for your time. And for everybody else, thank you for listening. Check out William's Bill site for more. And um, until next time. Keep it scary. All right. Keep it scary indeed. Thank you, sir. You take care. <laughs>